right? You say whatever you want. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons that we experience anxiety, but I'll tell you this. Peter Drucker, who was a management expert, one of the leading thinkers on business and organizational strategy and structure and so on, said the three hardest jobs uh, are being the president of a major university, the CEO of a hospital, and the pastor of a large church. Hello, Bezel T3. Comparing the calling of a pastor to a president or CEO. That was Scott Rachels, a former pastor who now runs a church staffing and coaching network called the Slingshot Group. Now, first thing to say perhaps is that a pastor should never be compared to a president or a CEO of a company. Andrew Stockland, the very young lead pastor of Inland Hills Church in Chino, California, died on August 25th from a suicide attempt the day before. Now, let's back up. This is a clip of the last sermon that Andrew gave before he suffered a massive panic attack so severe that he needed to go to the emergency room at a local hospital. Well, hello. Good to see you guys. My name's Andrew, one of the pastors here, and I hope you're having a great day so far, and uh, I'm just so excited to be with you, and I uh, want to say hello to all of our venues. Thanks for tuning in with us. This is the second installment of a series that we launched last weekend called Christian Atheist. And um, last weekend, by the way, Easter, we had a massive Easter. Over 5,000 people walked through our doors, which is incredible. We had s hundreds of people pray a prayer and in invite Jesus into the Lord. And the big celebration... Invite Jesus into their Lord. Well, I'm sure he meant to say invite Jesus into their lives or hearts. Now, he ends this sermon with a prayer that could very well have been a cry from his own pain. But um, just before we go and click our binders and put our pens away, let's just be still. Let's close our eyes, everybody. And just have a moment here. God, you know where we're all at in our faith journey. You know the questions that rattle in our mind. And you know the life circumstances that are right in front of us and the decisions that we need to make today, this week, this month. You know everything about us. You know our inadequacies. You know our shortcomings. You know all the things that we deal with. Andrew's dad was the founding pastor of Inland Hills Church and died of leukemia in 2015, which hit Andrew very hard. But also during that time, Andrew's family was dealing with a stalker that so threatened them that they had to move. Andrew also had some kind of a mass removed from his chest and at the same time passed many, many kidney stones. During the same time, amazingly enough, he also went to India and Africa on short-term missionary trips. He then came home and preached last Easter seven services. Now here is his mother, who was on the leadership staff of Inland Hills, explaining to the congregation what happened the week after he preached the sermon you just watched clips of. So all of that has caught up with him, and he is exhausted. He's, he, he is completely depleted. And um, this last Thursday, that all came to a breaking point, and he had an extreme panic attack that um, led us to, uh, forced us to take him to ER. So that was sad, and it was scary, but it was also a huge wake-up call for us. And so we have prayed and uh, reached out to people that can uh, give us good wisdom. And we have decided as a team around him that Andrew needs to hit pause. And so he did. That next week, April 15th, 2018, Scott Rachel spoke as a guest speaker. And here is some of what Scott said. But there's something that's all consuming about leading a church, about people's expectations, about people just grabbing you right after the Sunday morning. Hey, just a couple thoughts I wanted to give to you. Oh, great, let me jot those down so I can put those on my list. Doing the funerals of friends, going to your dad's funeral, carrying the weight 
of management and leadership for a staff, a team, developing them, programs, strategies, messages, getting up on Sunday and bearing your heart and soul so that people could have some insight into the magnificence of a great God that you, you can barely, you're like, uh, we are, I am, Drew, is, we are, we're like drunken sailors trying to follow a straight line when it comes to that. Now I'll say it again, a teaching pastor of a church is not called to be a president or a CEO. A pastor is not called to bear the weight of management and leadership and staff and a team. The, the teaching pastor is primarily called to preach the Word of God and oversee the care of his congregation. The rest of that stuff is to be given to the ruling elders and the deacons to deal with, primarily. And this is where non-denominational megachurches become their own worst enemy because they, not intending to all the time, but they prop up the lead pastor as the Pope of the church who in effect becomes the CEO. If a pastor feels like a drunken sailor when preaching the word of God, then he needs to let go of some of this less important stuff and study and meditate on the scriptures more and regain his sea legs. Now, to be fair, Scott does say what is right and true in principle. Because Drew is not the lead pastor of this church. And Carol would tell you that Dave, Pastor Dave, was not the lead pastor of this church because the pastor of this church, the lead pastor, the supreme shepherd of this place, the senior pastor that is in this place, is Jesus Christ. That's the one. So rest assured, rest assured that you've never been more well-led than right now. The problem is that in reality, it's not understood that way. And therein lies the rub. A mega church has to have the leader, the visionary, the one who holds it all together. And many times when a mega church pastor leaves a church, not always, but a lot of the time, that church falls apart in some way or another. And why is that? Well, it's because of that pernicious cult of personality that is always present. I mean, pick your pastor, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Stephen Furtick, Brian Houston, Ed Young Jr. The list can go on and on. It's they, they themselves and not Jesus Christ that are the centerpiece of that church. Now let's fast forward to Andrew's final sermon before he took his own life. My name's uh, Andrew, and uh, man, it feels so good to be back with you. Uh, last weekend was my first uh, Sunday um, back from summer sabbatical. Now, Andrew seems, from outward appearances, almost to be overly enthusiastic. He's upbeat, and he's glad to be back preaching. And he begins by promoting the next preaching series coming up in September. This series is over eight years in the making for me, for a lot of reasons. And I can't wait to fill you in more of why and how excited I am and what I think this series is going to do for our church and every single one of us. Um, but you're going to have to wait until team night, because at team night, which is happening this Friday night, okay, so this Friday night is team night, is a uh, kind of a rally of leaders, all of our staff, all of our volunteers, all of our leaders. And so we pack out this room and lots of music. It's kind of like a worship night, a lot of fun, a lot of energy. Um, we, everyone who comes gets a free t-shirt, all right? So that's worth coming. And then um, they give me like 20, 30 minutes to cast some vision share what's on my heart, talk about the future of the church. Sadly, that vision would never be cast. No t-shirts would be handed out. Team night Friday was Friday the 24th of August, the day Andrew attempted to end his life. Here is a bit more of Andrew's very last sermon. So in these last few months, as I've been on this sabbatical and I've been meeting with lots of doctors, I was sitting with uh, my psychiatrist. And I never thought I'd be sitting with, my, with a psychiatrist. After doing his reviews and studies and investigations and, you know, asking me all these questions, he says, Andrew, you don't have CDO or OCD. You are what we call, get this, you are what we call 
magnificently, magnificently obsessed. Andrew died on the 25th of August. Now folks, this is a very hard video for me to do. I didn't really want to do it. I'm doing it because suicide is occurring at an all-time epidemic proportion and clearly no one is immune. Currently, it is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S., just under things like heart attacks, cancer, strokes, and car accidents. And it really hit home for me when a friend of mine told me that his son, I think he's 14 or 15 years old, attempted suicide because of failing grades in school. Now, I don't understand that any more than I understand a Christian pastor with a wife and three very young kids committing suicide. But folks, it happens. Now, what drove Andrew to that final decision on that Friday will never be known this side of glory. But I can tell you this, pain is a great motivator. It drives most of us in our right mind to seek help, but it can also drive a person not in their right mind to utter despair. Now, let's take a breath and see what the Bible has to say about suicide. It's not much. There are five incidents of real suicide recorded in the Bible. I say real because Samson, some might say that's suicide, but I don't think so. They are Abimelech, King Saul and his armor bearer, Ahithophel, Zimri, and Judas, the betrayer of Jesus. In each of these cases, we have a picture of a, a lack of trust or outright disobedience towards God. Now, undoubtedly, suicide is a moral sin. It falls under the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Now, there are many sins that come under this commandment, but the two primary ones are the unjust taking away of the life of others or the taking away of our own life. You know, in, chapter, in, uh, in Acts chapter 16, that is, Paul prevents the suicide of the Philippian jailer. Remember in uh, verse 27, 28, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors flung open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. So I think we can all agree, suicide is a sin, but is it the unpardonable sin? And this is what his wife stated on Instagram. Last night, she says, she puts this public, last night the love of my life, the father of my children, and the pastor of our incredible church took his last breath and went to be with Jesus. That was YouTuber Evangelist Anita Fuentes, who by the incredulous look on her face seems to disagree with that. People want to think that suicide is okay. It's not okay. It is ungodly. It is evil. It is wicked. Now, who on earth thinks suicide is okay? Surely no one that I know, Christian or non-Christian. And you better believe God did all he can to save that soul. God did all he could to save Andrew's soul, but, but he wasn't able to pull it off? <laughs> that totally flies in the face of the words of our Lord when he said in John 6, 37 and following, he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. And he says in verse 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Is suicide forgivable? Really? You're going to ask that question? What about what God did? You're going to tell me, you're going to ask the question, is suicide forgivable? Let me ask you back. Is God's grace so abundant that it could prevent you from suicide? Now, the only unforgivable sin that I know of is the one that Jesus talks about. We see it in Matthew 12, 31, and I think there's another parallel passage. We read there, I tell you, every sin, that would include suicide, and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. The Apostle John speaks of a sin that leads to death, which I believe is the same thing that Jesus was teaching about a continuing rejection of the gospel by which the Holy Spirit uses to save sinners. And in the case of the apostate Christian, we have Hebrews 6, which says, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. I can't believe, oh my, is she saying that? Oh my God, she calls herself a Christian? You're darn right. A Holy Spirit-filled woman of God who cast out demons. 
Oh, well, uh, I didn't know that. Huh. You know, this sister has some serious reconsidering of what God's Word actually teaches. There are people in the church, there are leaders in the church that are saying, if, if one commits suicide, God knows their heart. They, 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 they're not going to go to hell. They're going to go straight to heaven. Okay, now here I agree with our friend Anita the Exorcist. A person's heart has nothing to do with going to heaven or not. It has everything to do with God's work of justification. It has to do with trusting in Jesus Christ alone to save people from their sins. The born-again person belongs to Jesus and is declared not guilty before God on account of the person and work of the Savior Jesus Christ. And once justification happens, sanctification begins to kick in. Look at 1 John 1. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Go to 1 John 2, beginning verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, Christians walk in the light and no, no longer walk in darkness. However, the old sinful nature retains some of its control in body, mind, and spirit, causing a continual conflict in every believer. The old nature tries to get its way in opposition to the spirit who indwells us. And the spirit who indwells us fights to assert his authority over the flesh. But in the end, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, enables the regenerate nature in each believer to overcome in the end. And God, if they really believe God says, oh, welcome home. You're a bit early, but that's okay. Come on in. What happened? Oh, you oh, you did? Uh, it's all right. You know what? I got you. Don't even worry about it. That's not God doing that. No, no. Uh, God will not be surprised when one of his elect from the foundation of the world enters into his presence. God is sovereign, and that means that he is in control of everything that happens, either directly or by secondary causes, meaning that even by the sinful actions of men, God's eternal decrees will come to pass. Before the creation of the world, by his eternal purpose and his perfect will, God has chosen in Christ those who are predestined to life and to everlasting glory. And he did this out of mercy and love and grace. His choice of these elect had nothing to do with how these individuals would be or would act. Self-generated faith, good works or perseverance had no part whatsoever in influencing God's selection of his elect. 2 Timothy 1.9, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. God is angry with the wicked every day. God is, God is not okay with wicked acts. Then you might as well, then, 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 then there was no need for Jesus to go to the cross if it was all acceptable. Then adultery would be allowed in heaven. Someone, you know, there are people who have died while in the very act of sin. As Christians, as Christians, did they go to heaven? Yes, Anita, they do. Look at Romans 7, uh, beginning at 24, and then go to chapter 8, verse 2. Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he's talking about the Apostle Paul, present tense. He says, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And then he goes on in chapter 8, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. Paul's argument in chapter 7 is that God's grace is greater than all, all our sin. He admits that there is this irreconcilable war between the new nature we're given by the spirit when we are regenerated 
and the vestiges, the old vestiges of Adam that still remain within the believer until the day he or she dies. However, Christ's perfect life and substitutionary death and glorious bodily resurrection is enough to save a sinner from his sins past, present, and future, even the sin of suicide. They're saying suicide is valid. It's, it's forgivable. No, 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 no. No. No, it's not. Let me tell you by the word of God, it is not forgivable. Once you do that, it's over, folks. It's over. I don't hear anyone saying that suicide is valid, Anita. You are teaching that there is a limit to the effectiveness of Jesus Christ's propitiation. That means the taking away of God's wrath on the believer's behalf. You, Anita, are in fact saying that there are some sins which are beyond the reach of Christ's atoning work on the cross, which is clearly unbiblical. Need I remind you of Romans 8, 31 through 39? And let me highlight just a few of those verses in that passage. Look at that entire passage if you get a chance. It reads, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, including ourselves, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I'd like to wrap this video up with a few quotes from a funeral sermon that Dr. Michael Horton preached for a close friend in ministry who also took his own life. I'm going to give you a few quotes from that sermon. He says, We find ourselves filled with a variety of emotions, pity, sorrow, rage, puzzlement, resentment, and despair. We wonder how things could possibly have ended this way. We wonder how someone who believed and preached the sufficiency of God's word and his grace in the face of all trials of life could leave us this afternoon wondering, if it was not sufficient for him, is it indeed sufficient for me? What happens when Christianity doesn't work? He goes on to say, but even if Christianity does not answer every problem we have in this life, surely that eternal perspective helps us cope with them. So why, we wonder, did our father, brother, husband, friend, and pastor cut his life short? Whatever was wrong in Tim's life, he had an unshakable conviction that his witness is in heaven. He knew that Jesus Christ was his intercessor a friend to whom he could pour out tears to God. And he knew that Jesus Christ, his elder brother, was pleading on his behalf with God as a man who pleads for his friend. So why didn't this confidence keep our brother from ending his life? We cannot answer that question. But I can say this. Even if we are too weak to hang on to Christ, he is strong enough to hang on to us. Even though we may not be able to face tomorrow, Christ has already passed through death to the other side and has taken away death's sting for us. God didn't promise any of us health, wealth, and happiness. In fact, he tells us that we who expect to share in Christ's glory will also participate in his suffering. He goes on to say, Christianity is not true because it works for people in that pragmatic, utilitarian way, but because nearly 2,000 years ago, outside the city center of Jerusalem, the Son of God was crucified for our sins and was raised for our justification. We are not here to judge God today, but neither are we here to judge Tim Brewer. No one can justify his actions. But Tim Brewer is justified before God. You see, being accepted before God is not a matter of what we have done or left undone, or we would all be lost. It is a matter of trusting in that which Christ has done. 
For he has finished the work of our redemption. He has paid the ransom for our sins and satisfied the justice that our guilt requires. With Job, Tim can say, I will see him in my flesh, in that very body that at 18 years old fell 75 feet while rock climbing, leaving him with a broken back and reconstructed feet. In that body that witnessed the death of his brother, by leukemia. It is that body that together with Beth held two children with severe learning disabilities as gifts from God and in the body that just four months ago was struck by a train that Tim will see God. It will be a reconstructed body not by the skillful hands of doctors below but by the hands of his creator the great physician that Tim's body will be perfectly mended and free of pain. On that day, Scripture assures us, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more pain or mourning or crying or death. For the old order of things has passed away. Until then, he is in God's presence without his body, awaiting that triumphal entry of God's liberated captives arriving in triumphal procession together through the gates of the eternal city after a long, hard winter through the wilderness. Now, Mike goes on, he says, to Beth, and I want to insert here that Beth was Tim Brewer's wife, and I want to insert here to Kayla, who was the wife of Andrew, and the rest of their families. Uh, Mike goes on to say, I know you have lost your husband, son, father, and brother, although I myself have lost one of my closest friends. I can't begin to know your suffering, but God knows what this is like, for he too lost a son. He committed his son to dreadful suffering and a cruel death because through it he could save people who hated him and make them his own sons and daughters. You can turn to him as your father, not only because he knows how you feel, but because his loss secured your adoption into his family and made Tim and Andrew joint heirs with Christ. And for all of us here who are afraid of death or of life, the good news is that this man is still at God's right hand, this advocate who pleads our case. His name is Jesus Christ. And if your faith is in this rock of ages and in this mighty fortress, he will be your friend in this world and in the world to come.